Good evening, uh, everybody, and thank you for joining Residential Estates Pulse on Property Episode 5. It's the Christmas edition. Oh, um, uh, yes, we've we have failed to come in in Christmas yes. jumpers, uh, apart from Johnsy. Yeah. Well, I'll put a Christmas red scarf on. That oh, there, was, there, there we go. There we go. Okay, we, we're not being let down. We're, uh, we're close, we're close, and we do have a Christmas tree. Oh, yeah. It's illuminated as well. I didn't notice that. It is. It, it is. is. Yes. So, um, thank you very much for joining us um, in this December edition of Pulse on Property Episode 5. My name is Jason Guest. I'm the Business and Marketing Manager for Residential Estates. Joining me this evening from Residential Estates uh, to my left, we have... Andrew. Andrew Brassey, uh, Business Development Manager. Good evening. Michael Good evening. Johns, Senior Investment Consultant. Thank you. And uh, joining us this evening, we have a very special guest, Professor Phil Harris. Uh, Hello, good, good evening. evening. Yeah, thank good you for joining evening. us. It's been like a university challenge, isn't it, when they introduce themselves, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't the fancy our chances up again with the questions. No, so I do. <laughs> no, no, no. Who's no. this chap? <laughs> no. no, I'm not Jeremy Clarkson either, you know. I'm not going to sort of denigrate the royals or whatever. I went to the same school as Jeremy Clarkson. Did you? I did. Not in the same year, obviously, but um, mm. yes, there we go. He got yeah. expelled. Um, there we go. Right. <laughs> so, there we go. Right. So, um, this evening, we've uh, obviously got our usual um, chatting through property stuff. We're going to be talking Christmas tree statistics in the UK. When do we put them up? Um, and uh, all things Christmas trees. A little bit of Christmas related facts for you. Uh, we're going to be talking generation rent, backing Labour's bill to regulate Airbnb um, and co. Landlords hit back at acquisition of turning students. Um, we've got renters picket six London letting agents forcing some to close. St Ives in Cornwall, named happiest place to live in Great Britain. And then, um, Professor Phil Harris, you're going to be giving us a very in-depth talk about Machiavelli and modern political leadership and lobbying. I'm glad, glad I put my Do teeth my in. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, so, first thing, a little bit of Christmas for you. It is Christmas. It is. Is that season? The season to be jolly. Yeah. Um, so Christmas trees in the UK. Almost 10 million people in the UK often don't put up a Christmas tree um, they, uh, at all. So Surprising, isn't it? 10 million. You know, it's some, and, and we sell between 8 and 10 million Christmas trees a year. Mm. So you think, you know, there's 20 odd million. Just like that. Have you put up a tree? Yes. We have a real tree as opposed to a, an artificial tree. Do you put up a tree? We put up an artificial one, which we bought locally, and you know we're now almost counting how many times we've been able to put the artificial one up. Right. Yeah, and it's quite a good one. Okay. Yeah. They've improved significantly, haven't they? I mean, the early ones, yeah. those silver things, looked a bit sparse, didn't they? Now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it used to be the arguments about picking up the needles, wasn't it? Yes. And things like that, and vacuum. When it was a Norway then. spruce, I think, or Norway oh, fir. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. And you yeah. get them stuck in your feet. Quite painful ones that have dried. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's about eight different varieties of Christmas tree. The Nordman being the most popular. About 80% of all Christmas trees sold in Nordman. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. And um, um, Mr. Johns, do you put up a Christmas tree? I don't. I'm, I'm the Grinch here. Oh, right. Okay. Um, well, off off with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, say that. I don't put one on. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so... We've got uh, one in 35 UK adults put their tree up on the 22nd of December. No, nope, we were a little bit late. Uh, first weekend in De no, second weekend in December, we, we put ours up. Second week in December? Second weekend. You don't put up a tree. Well, I don't put up a tree, but I, don't say, I certainly don't see the point of putting one up on the 22nd of December. Do you know, I say I don't have a tree. Uh, I, got, I was lent a little tree for my <laughs> flat. About four or five years ago, mm. and I've never taken it down. It's just stuck on the uh, in the lounge. Right. So it's not a Christmas tree, then. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an all-year-round tree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When do you put your tree up? Um, about the eighteenth, sixteenth, eighteenth, around there. About the weekend before. Mm. Um, and when does it come down? Twelve days after Christmas. Twelve days after Christmas. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or when you get fed up with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> when the needles drop, yes, in the, yeah. in the old case. I, I, I think the other thing is, is you know, I, I suppose one would stick it up for Advent, wouldn't one? Yes. Really? Yes. And, and then take it down. That, that would be the traditional way. But I must admit, um, I was wandering around locally, and there were some up in October. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I thought, grief, this is bonkers. In people's yeah. houses? And, and yeah, what? yeah. Oh, wow. It's a bit too early, that, isn't it? Oh, it's it's really. But yeah. You've got Halloween. You've got. But people Halloween. love moaning about it, don't they? Mm. When they've heard the first Christmas song on the radio, mm. oh my god! You know, they can't believe. And, and then the first person to put the lights up outside the house. Look at him! You know, people love moaning about that. I think that's what the British do. Yeah, they love <laughs> moaning about everything, yeah, I enjoy don't that. they? <laughs> So, when it comes to Christmas trees, the most festive city is Liverpool, with 93% of people putting a Christmas tree up. The least festive city is Brighton, where just 77% have a tree up in their households. Come on, Brighton, sort out those resting Grinch faces this Christmas. Mm. Or should that be um, Northwich? Is it Northwich? Yeah, I'm from Northwich, but you, it, we are being mentioned later on in the slides, I do believe. You are? The, uh, yeah. Uh, town? Northwich town? Yeah, yeah town, town, yeah. So is that to make up for the lack of Christmas trees? No, you'll see. You'll yeah, see later on in the presentation. I've, that really, I've seen the slides. They were featured. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. A little bit about Christmas trees. Um so let's move on with a bit of property uh, property news for the for the month. Um, Generation Rent backs Labour bid to regulate Airbnb and Co. Properties in England should require planning consent to be used as short lets via Airbnb and other platforms. It is also likely to give local authorities the powers to introduce a registration scheme for short lets. Wilson Craw claims that England's housing supply lost nearly 11,000 properties to the second home and holiday let sector between 2021 and 2022. And he says this continues a trend of homes leaving the residential sector that has accelerated in recent years and is equivalent in some areas to the loss of more than 2% of the housing stock between 2019 and 2022. Well, uh, me and Andrew have got a very simple solution to this we discussed before, but we'll come to that at the end. The... I think what the government would have liked is for when people buy to let investors stop making money on rents because the rents were 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 decreasing um, and and more legislation came in for buy to let investors, they were hoping that people would revert them back to the residential market, and that's just not simply the what's going to happen. A lot of people thought, well, I need to make money. I've invested in this property. I'm now going to rent out on a short-term basis because that's where I'm going to make my money. Unfortunately, a lot of people did it illegally. You look at the three main people people did it illegally. One, it wasn't in their lease that they were allowed to do it on short-term lets. Secondly, their buy-to-let mortgage didn't allow for short-term lets. Or thirdly, their insurance, their buy-to-let mm-hmm. insurance didn't allow for short-term lets. But... You know, th- th- this is what's happened all over the UK. People have been finding ways in which they can still make money. And now with the mortgages gone the way they have as well, it's made it even harder. But really, it's nothing to do with It's a different sector. We just simply aren't building enough social houses uh, as a country. We're not. We're not. You know, what is it? Something like 225,000 homes you have to build annually? And we're nowhere near that. Mm. And the, there was talk the other day of the number of construction companies going under, the small to medium-sized construction company or local builder going into administration. I think there's something like 2,500 companies last this year um, have gone into administration that would normally have built the smaller, maybe the social housing. Mm. And I think you know, not being political, the only way you're going to change this is, is actually building more social housing. And you're not going to get the persimmons, the Berkeley homes, you're not going to get them to do it. It has to be either government or local council driven because you're not going to get a builder to build a house at cost. Well, you know, they're not a charity. They're there to make money. And, okay, there's varying amounts of money they're looking to make from development, 
but unless they're going to make a profit, they're not going to continue trading. Hence, so many going into administration. It's down to... I don't like saying it's down to the government, but it, it has to be a government directive or a local council directive to build social housing. At, at, unfortunately, it'll be at a level of um, at cost. Oh, and we would fully welcome, you know, um, uh, some legislation in this area because you've got a lot of mavericks that are, are, are maverick property managers here now that have a buy-to-let property, we're just going to let it out and give it to an estate agent. And now they're trying to put it on Airbnb and do everything themselves. And what's happened is the whole standard of these properties, which are very important to the tourism in the, in the country as well, the whole standard's dropped. And I, you know, I've stayed in some Airbnb, spent some really good money and been really disappointed. Where I got, whereas... Companies like residential estates that put a lot into making sure it's right for the customers um, are good for the market. And so what will happen, more legislation will drive pe more people to use companies like ourselves to look after the properties and, uh, and, and the, the, hopefully the maverick, um, the, the maverick letting will, will disappear. I think you're right there, Mike. I think it, 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 it's one of those factors, not just in short term or corporate um, or furnished holiday, but in, uh, as a landlord in general, that local authorities, the government have brought in legislation to try and improve the quality of the housing stock. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's always going to be that rogue landlord, isn't there, that has damp... I mean, uh, unfortunately, there's a case at the moment, isn't there, with that, that young child who died, who lived in a, in, in a housing association apartment that was riddled with damp. Mm -hmm. and it's that that we need to eradicate. And I think... Whether you run it as Airbnb, short-term let, or AST, it's all about how you actually manage it. And I, I think a, a lot of sort of residents within, I say, a block of 50, where you've got maybe five as short-term, it's how those five are managed that impact on the other 45. I, I think the issues that seem to be coming out in the media, and I, I think also in terms of you know, consumers, is, is one, insulation and standards of property uh -huh. to keep uh -huh. people warm. I think you, you can see over the last three months, a lot of people have actually been complaining about that. Yes. And certainly when one travels around and comes to the UK and does a comparison, the UK is pretty cold. A lot of the stuff is, is quite inadequate. Some of the new build is better, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is, is also standards in lets, you know. And the mould thing is both a private sector and a public sector yep. issue. And I think that... It's just comprehensive legislation and a government that is keen to see building and quality. Alongside that, of course, you've got also the skills to actually build, you know, and, and the way we can bring up quality apprentices to actually deliver. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, um, a lot of us found um, we were importing builders from the continent yep. really to build. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were better because they'd been trained. So th there's a need to get the quality right and ensure the quality is right. And I think that will work. Yes. Um, and, yep. and, you know, certainly with the young who want to make an investment, um, if the quality's there, they'll go for it. I think they also like being warm as well. Yes, yes. well insulated <laughs> indeed. Well, electricity is the big it. issue at the moment yeah. with, with them because previously people had come into an Airbnb, or I say an Airbnb, I'm going to say a short term let property because it's not yeah, just yeah. Airbnb, and they would just leave the heating on when they left. Now that could kill, you know, it's, it's like doubling the costs now, and, and we all know how much electricity is mm. at the moment. Um, and we've had to put in measures to to combat that so that we can actually remotely turn electricity off. Smart in, meters and things Smart like that. meters, yeah. 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 That's um, added costs as well. We've had a, a couple of questions in. Thank you. Uh, this is from uh, Bash Ali. Um, and uh, we are streaming on a number of platforms, guys, so please feel free to um, pop your questions in the chat wherever you're watching from, and we will do our best to answer them as we go along. Um, but Bash, thank you very much uh, for your questions. We've got, what are your thoughts on the government abandoning house buildings? And also, um, when is the best time to sell stroke offload BTL properties with sitting tenants? 
Um, I, I would say on the sitting tenant side of it, as in an AST, as opposed to a true sitting tenant, um, as the length of the lease, don't wait until it's a two-month lease, or, or, or uh, as in the term, yes. when you've got 12 months, 11 months, so the incoming, the new investor has the longest period of stability with that tenant. Mm. If you leave it till a month before that tenant vacates, they may vacate and then you may have a void. Far better to, to sell it at, um, when the AST has just been signed, I would say. Mm. And what was the second question about the government? What are your thoughts on government abandoning house buildings? Um, so I guess the question there is, um, should the government not interfere with, with house building or should they um, step up to the mark and actually start social housing building themselves? Um, well, we covered that. Yeah, I think, that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think um, if, if the government wants true social housing, mm. I think they have to build it or have to employ people to build it on their behalf because I don't think your, your local builder will, will do that. They talk about affordable housing, and where I live, they built a small scheme, seven houses, and the the most affordable, the one that had to be affordable housing, was two hundred and fifty thousand, and this was seven years ago. Well, two fifty, who's that affordable for? Certainly not a first time buyer. So I think the term affordable housing has to be maybe better defined. Are we talking up to a hundred thousand? Are we talking up to one hundred and fifty thousand? Um, and I think, again, sweeping generalisation, very sweeping. Um, we've got a couple of new developments fairly close to where we live. Three bed detached, four bed detached, five bed detached. They are not building a two bed townhouse terrace, whatever you want to call it. They're not mm. building that starter home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the issues that major house builders, um, I wouldn't say have, but they're not building starter homes mm. because it's not cost effective. And that's where, unfortunately, maybe the government have to step in and, and build them. Um, affordable housing yeah no agree that's my take yeah. on it no absolutely fully agree so hopefully that's answered your questions Bash. thank you very much and keep them coming anybody else that has questions out there feel free to pop them in chat um so let's move on landlords hit back at accusation accusation of turning students the national residential landlords association has hit back at a claim that it is seeking to turn students against the government's proposed reforms for the private rental sector the government's plans to make all student tenancies open-ended or periodic would only make it harder to find accommodation. It would mean no landlord could ever guarantee that housing would be available for students at the start of each academic year. This would cause chaos, confusion and anxiety for students unable to plan where they live and with who. I think that's quite a valid um, statement that if, if you did away with the standard AST, so that the student is signing for say generally 40 foot, 44 or 51 mm. weeks if you did away with that and had it open-ended um let's, my daughter's a case she went to ucl after 10 weeks didn't like it if the tenancy was open-ended she could have walked away and that accommodation that she had rented would potentially be empty for the next nine months and mike and i were talking earlier if you turn it into reverse the student may not want to leave in june july so the landlord then may not be able to tenant it from September onwards, knowing it's going to be empty because the current tenant may may be there. Um, so it, it, I think the AST mm. has to be there from a student perspective, not just the student, but tenants in general, to give, uh, what's the word we should use, confidence to, to both parties, both tenant and landlord, that it is a fixed term. And within that term, and it goes back I think, to what we were saying earlier, mm. it's about having the quality accommodation. And if it is quality accommodation, it, it's right that it's on a fixed term. And that term could be you know, six months, eight months, nine months, whatever the term may be. But I think it's right that it's fixed. Well, we spoke about this as well, that it, it kind of doesn't open floodgates, but it, it suggests that we kind of need more PBSA. Yes. Which then, then takes the uh, emphasis off private housing and people offering that, which then puts that back to the private sector. You've got more security for the students when they're coming into a new area, they don't know the place, they've got a PBSA, a nice modern purpose-built you know, thing for them to move so. into. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, that's one area that really doesn't make sense. 
there's a huge shortage of student accommodation across all sectors. So PBSA, HMOs, whatever it might be, residential housing. Um, to actually have uh, PBSA units that are empty because of this new legislation and have people, students having no other option but to get three, four of them together and go and share a house, you know, and, and take that off the, off the residential housing market just is absolutely crazy. Mm. This was a system that's worked very, very well. Sorry. Mm. It's worked very well for a long time, this, this system. And it's, it's, a, it's a real slap in the face to the operators who, you know, have a good system sorted out for actually getting students in and out of these properties. I think the, the flexibility issue is the important one because if you like the way we teach students, the way we educate them, how they actually congregate is all changing. And I mean, we've seen that within COVID times or whatever. The reality is, is you know, a lot is online. Yeah. So therefore, you don't necessarily need massive blocks of student accommodation. And clearly, some universities have got problems in going through the basic numbers. I think the private sector, by and large, has been reasonably okay alongside it. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it. There's more flexibility. And I think that we need to start factoring that in because I do think a lot of you know, large-scale education will change. Yeah, I mean, you've got the trend even changes with, with, with video courses yeah. over the last few years, which has had a huge impact on people sort of coming and going. We've certainly seen that our uh, PBSA, Purpose Built Student Accommodation, developers and owners have been out there trying to source other solutions for investors that own them in order to give them a return, such as opening, it, opening the zoning up for, to, to other areas, such as actually renting them to nurses that we've done in... That's in London Road. In, in yeah. London Road. Yeah, yeah. We've also yeah. rented... Um, to the HS2 workers yeah. in order to get those units filled because the students just walked off site. You know, the moment that we, uh, uh, that COVID was announced, mm. and of course you would, it scared everybody. Well, there, there was a, a, I think it was Liverpool, um, John Moores, and, and bearing in mind Liverpool has one in, one in five students in Liverpool, I think it's John Moores, is a Chinese... Um, yeah. Yeah. It's Liverpool University. Liverpool yeah. University. It's Liverpool, is it? Um, was that you either go now, or you could be stuck here for the duration. Mm. So that's why they went because they thought if we don't go now, we could be stuck in the UK for a month, yeah. two months, two years. It was an unknown. And I think that a lot of universities. I don't know Frank Chester, but that's that was the directive they gave to students. Yeah. You're in our halls of accommodation. That's absolutely fine. But if you stay you may not be allowed to leave. So, yeah, they all upped and left, as I would. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, and that's, they're coming back. You know, you look at Glasgow, yeah. you look at Edinburgh, they were both saying, if you don't have accommodation, don't come to the course. Um, we'll defer it a year. Um, and, and again, just talking about deferring it, a number of universities last year deferred and offered to pay somewhere between six and £10,000 for that student to defer the course to this year and maybe even next year. Um, an indication, I think, of the demand for our, our education. You know, yeah. we, the UK should be proud of the levels of education that we can uh, we can offer. It's probably um, about the second largest um, earnings stream in export terms: oh. higher education and FE and schools. Yeah. A lot of people forget that; they just think it's only small, but the numbers, is you know, is yes. vast. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's bigger than the automotive industry, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, people think in old terms rather than currently. So although China may be dampening down and you've got all, all the barriers, whatever, you've got to remember India's coming on, Middle yep. East. Mm. Um, people also see it as very important that they get a quality education. So um, <coughs> there may be some turbulence in it but yeah it's there for good i think the other thing is i think in the recent recent reputation states us number one uk number two yeah. the, and then come the others so it, it's like an attractor as well you're looking for quality education 
And I think there's an element of kudos, isn't yeah. it? To, I went to this university, or I did that course. Um, and that's what attracts the overseas student, I think. Yeah, and it's been around a long time, and it's consistent, and it offers good products. And also, if you like, the great thing about some of those students that come here is they go away and they become ambassadors for us. Yes. You know, yep. and we forget that, so we actually benefit. Mm. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. So, renters, picket six London letting agents, Ooh. forcing some to close. Uh, this happened earlier in this month. Rents have risen by 20%. The LRU said in a statement it wanted to highlight the human cost of the rental crisis and claimed that letting agents played a key role in gouging rents well above inflation. While 39% of landlords have no debt on their <coughs> properties, landlords are exploiting the cost of living crisis as an excuse to hike rents well above incomes. The union claims rents have increased by an average of 20.5% or £3,378 per year, based on 150 rent rises reported to it since the 20th of September. Yeah, I mean, you really can't blame uh, estate agents for for the rising rents. I mean, the market is a supply, supply demand market. I mean, I know we're talking London. It's one, don't get me started, because yeah. I will get very annoyed about this, because people are very quick to blame agents oh. but in actual, and, and landlords as well. But ultimately, if, if you own a property and you can get somebody to pay, you want the money, if it's an investment, yeah. and you can get somebody to pay that, that's the market rent. And we've got a duty of care to both sides. I mean, whilst we don't want renters to, to be overpaying... We've also got to try and maximise the returns for the investors who have placed their business with us as well. So we're very much the middleman. And as soon as you start talking middleman, um, you, you, you can't really blame um, uh, supply demand on, on what we, we will do. All we can do is make sure that we're <coughs> very, very diligent in what we do. Um, and, 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 you know, fairness is... Not something you can associate with price in a supply demand market. Well, I think also, you know, we, we, we've been talking a lot about the government, should the government yeah. do this? Should, and if we re relate maybe to Scotland and Nicola Sturgeon or, or the SNP um, putting a rent freeze on it, so what they've done, they've, they've frozen the rents in Scotland for six months, and they, the Im implication is that they will extend that for a further six, maybe even 12 months. But any new tenancy, you set whatever rent you wish. Mm. So what Scotland have experienced is a, a, a massive hike in rents for those that are, are now coming onto the market. So effectively, you, you, you've shot the tenant in, or, or the, the potential tenant in the foot by saying there's a shortage of supply. Because of that shortage of supply as a government, we force the rents up. It goes back to supply and demand, doesn't it, as we've just been talking about. The, but so what we're seeing in Scotland, I think it's something like 25 26% increase in rents because there is a shortage. If it's a new tenancy, you can set the rent where you wish it to be set, yeah. as opposed to what it's maybe fixed at. The other element to that is, are you actually limiting the, uh, what's the word I should be using, the mobility of the tenant? So, you take a new job from, say, Glasgow to Edinburgh, 30 mile, half an hour, 45 minute commute, you're in a fixed tenancy at <coughs> 500, 600 pounds, but you go to the where you've just gained a, a employment, and that same accommodation might be now 800, because it's a new tenancy, they can set the rent where they want. So what do you do? Do you not take the job, or do you commute and spend a, a vast amount on, on, on commuting, because you're in a tenancy that's admittedly fixed at, at, at that rate? It, it just seems to be ill thought out, and I think we've got to be very careful, um, or the government needs to be very careful about legislation that has possibly unknown at the time consequences to what they do um, and as, as we've said you know it's not the agent that is setting the price it, it's the demand and th there was something online I think that um, you put the property on right move at 7.30 in the morning and by 11.30 you have 100 inquiries well that unfortunately is going to force so the next one you go yeah. to and just random figures you've set it at 500 you've had 100 inquiries in two hours 
the next one you go to, you can say, we could try 550 mm. for this. Mm. Same response. Then you get to 600. And this is what forces around. It's just supply and demand and the, and, and the fact there's um, so little out there. I think actually the agent a lot of the time helps the process because if the seller was selling direct and he was able to put a advert on right move and he put it on at 700 and after two hours he had 100 inquiries, you can guarantee that that seller will go on and change the price to 800. Yeah. Yes. That's not something that we do because actually we're incentivized to make the sale, to make a deal. So we don't want that business going to somebody else. So we're unlikely, you're unlikely, more unlikely to get gazumped actually using an agent as you are by, uh, by actually dealing directly with an owner. I think there's difficulty with frozen prices, isn't there, really? In that there's nothing new going to come on. Yes. Um, mm. Or anything new that comes on is going to be at such a premium because it isn't frozen. And um, therefore, it skews the market. I think that, that's the difficulty. Uh -huh. It's a blunt tool. I think they're using up in yes. Scotland. And it doesn't mm. seem to be working. It's not generating anything new. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's no. very true. And um, um, so, whilst you're in in that rent, you're fine. Yeah. And once you but want if to you're out, out of it, you're done for. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And there's, there doesn't seem to be any longevity in in the way that their model is. You know, yeah. it's all very short term. Let's try and get something done about it straight away and get some quick fixes. Um, there isn't a huge social housing policy alongside it. No. Which, which, if you were doing something like that, that's what you'd probably bring in. Well, it's the buzzword that everybody seems to be dodging in, in all governments is social housing. Yeah. We want to blame that on other people and... Uh, I, I think the difficulty is always in areas where, you know, <coughs> the property is getting hot mm. and local people can't live there anymore or people providing services. And, and you can mm. see that particularly in places like Cornwall. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that really has become a hot spot. And I think that's something we've got to be careful about, how we can retain, if you like, the skills in our communities as well and bring mm. people through. And the, again, Phil, there was something in in that respect. Yeah. That if you, where we're talking earlier about maybe licensing short term furnished holiday, there's talk that if you set a ceiling, so this town can mm. have twenty, that town can have a hundred, it actually increases the value of those that you license. Yeah. So, so instead of you thinking, you know, it'll drive prices <laughs> down, those that have it does the opposite. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it works in, in in reverse. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Mm. it's the same in shops, you know, but yes. it's the same in the housing market. It is. Which will be the fault of the agent. Oh. <laughs> in, and in our business as well, I mean, we're constantly being asked where the next hotspot is. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's always interested in hotspots. And every area that we depict, that some of my um, clients will joke with me and say, <laughs> every time you bring out a new property development, it's the new hotspot. And, and in most areas of the UK... There are there are regeneration programs happening in a lot of areas, and there's areas we look at what happened in Shoreditch in, in London, which is a which is which is a prime example. You know, you've got houses which are effectively doubling in price overnight. Yeah. You know, and, and what what you know if if you own that plot of land that is building certain amount of houses on that land, and all of a sudden you're losing a couple of million quid because you've got to add in a social element. No, of course they're going to find ways around it. Of course they're going to find ways around it. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. Right, we're on to, uh, I'm guessing... This is where uh, Northwich this, comes is, is, in. This is where we're you're talking about right? number... I draw your attention, everybody, to number 16, which is my hometown, Northwich. So, so for anybody listening on a podcast, we are at St Ives in Cornwall, named happiest place to live in Great Britain, and just running very quickly through the top twenty. Uh, uh, let's let's go down from twenty down. So at number twenty, we've got uh, Londono or Clandono, Wales. Before you go into the list, Jason, how have they set? How, what determines to be the happiest place to live? How many people oh. smiling when they drove round? Yeah. <laughs> I think John's has just been paying. 
just to <coughs> I think it's because I've been spending more time in the office. The actual people of Northwich are generally happier. So, and that's, that's how that's worked. So number 20, Clondon, no Wales. Number 19, Newbury, South East. Number 18, Macclesfield, North West. Mm. 17, Altrincham, North West. 16, Northwich. Northwich, North West. 15, Worcester, West Midlands. 14, Leamington Spa, West Midlands. 13, Monmouth, Wales. 12, Falmouth, South West. 11, Richmond upon Thames, Greater London. 10, Sirencester, South West. 9, Stirling, Scotland. 8, Bury St Edmunds, East of England. 7, Anglesey in Wales. 6, Harrogate, Yorkshire and the Humber. 5, Perth in Scotland. 4, Hexham, North East. 3, Woodbridge, East of England. 2, Gallashales, Scotland. Gallashields. And number 1, St Ives, South West. The good thing about that list is that there are... uh, The one good thing, I think, is that there are actually... There's some nice places in there, Richmond on Thames, you know. Um, yeah. But there's also some poorer areas as well. So it doesn't necessarily correlate that it has to be a, a rich a area. Of classes, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and it's well spread as well, though. It's well spread around the. Just, you know, what we've been talking about short term lets, lack of yeah. housing, that sort of thing. A lot of those places are actually very dominant on, on tourism. Anglesey, mm. St. Ives, and yet they're saying. Presumably, this was a local. Um, voting system to say, you know, I live in St. Ives, I vote as, as a happy place to live, and yet it's inundated with tourism, mm. which certainly St. Ives, the, camp, the, the, the locals there don't want tourism. Mm. So you think, again, how's it sort of worded? How, what was the survey to create that, that list? I, I think the other thing is, is, you know, what about the unhappiest? Yes, 20? yes. You know, and you'll notice that they don't actually normally publicize that, so sort of, yeah. Put it's usually because there's on two on the same list, the, 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 the ones that are on both lists. I was going to say, yeah. also Northwood. It's like when the... I worry when, about them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when GQ magazine and, and Loading magazine produce um, sexiest uh, female yeah. and then ugliest female, and there's always, you know, number one's normally in, number, in the top three in the other list. Mm. So, I mean, the one thing that's happened actually in Northwich more recently, which could have made a difference is they're actually spending a lot of money there with the new Barons Key project in the, in the, in the, in the town centre. There's now, you know, a new cinema and uh, new uh, shops moving in, new eating houses. So generally speaking, when people can see money being spent and their, and their location being um, uh, invested into, then generally that can increase. That's the only thing I can think of, really. Yeah. Are you happy? I'm happy. I'm happy. I live in a suburb of Northwich, though, so not in the centre. Um, but, yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, I think um, I think that's actually uh, our, well, that's a bit of a quick roundup of the news for this month in terms of property. Hmm. Taking a few little bits and bobs there. Um, I just thought we'd have a general chat about 2022, a look back at this year. The um, property housing market um, and 2023. Um, I'll start with you, Phil. Just in terms of property, have you had any dealings property wise? Um, I've I got various friends buying property or investing in property. And then the other thing is, is you know, you can see there's like a boom of development of houses going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so um, certainly where I live, there's been at least five. You know, major bits of building works in the last year, whereas the five years before there was none. Yeah. So mm. that's actually showing, if you like, mm. resist desire growth, and some of the um, new uh, investment is overseas as well. Mm. People who've settled here, who have access to families, who are pushing it in into the system. Mm. So if if you like, it isn't all doom and gloom. I think the other thing is, is as well, is we were a bit skewed by COVID, weren't we, really? Like everybody was around the globe. Mm. Um, now we're starting to see, well, what are the trends post-COVID? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we won't really get a feel on that until the middle of next year, I think. 
Um, you know, when you talk to people from the other side of the world, I mean, bless them, a lot of Chinese have just been locked up for 12 months, 18 months. And, you know, um, when you see somebody coming over to this country, um, they're so full of enthusiasm because they're out. Mm. Uh, and it's a bit like us. We had to a lesser extent mm. with COVID. So, yeah, I think there is a bit of... Um, pleasant enthusiasm for actually investing mm. um, but if you like it will take a while mm. yeah uh, it's nice to sort of hear that viewpoint because I think it's one that we share yes. certainly here yeah. that, that we've seen that it's been a strange old year mm. um, John Z? yeah I mean to, to move on from what Phil said actually with with the, on the Covid side I think a lot of builders were very keen to get going again after Covid because yeah. there was a there was a a lull in activity which killed off a lot of developers actually yeah. um now with the mortgage situation mm-hmm. um and the increase in mortgage rates um we haven't really had that time to yeah. to to, for, to repair the damage done by covid and so really uh, we're, we're seeing particular trends now more people are investing in in lower value cash projects actually using their own money to maybe invest in a, let's say, a one-bedroom apartment in Doncaster or Halifax or Redford or, or, or Preston or Bolton in one of the smaller cities or larger mm. towns, as opposed to buying a three-bed in Manchester and paying half a million quid yeah. with a mortgage. So uh, there's more people on the cash side, which has been brilliant for our resale division. I'm sure Andrew will tell you about um on the mortgage side you can buy off plan now and not have to worry about your mortgage for 12 months 18 months two years there's a lot of people out there that don't like buying off plan particularly people who are anti-risk uh but everything comes with risk um uh, every investment does um but uh, the, the, those who are keen to, to get the advantage of buying off plan are back in the market because they know that the, rent, the mortgage market will improve over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, probably a lot sooner. And if it doesn't, if you're buying with short-term lets, then uh, you're still going to be pleasantly surprised anyway because you're going to have the returns that you're not going to get in standard buy to lets. So, you know, my, my advice for anybody investing at the moment is to look at uh, anything on a short-term let uh, basis or anything of lower value with, um, with, with, with tenants in place. Fantastic. Andrew? Well, I think uh, with what Mike and Philip said, I think it, it, it's been an interesting year. Um, it's had its ups and downs. The resale side of the market has been strong for us, certainly on the student um, mm. element. Where Mike comes in, we we're talking maybe a 50 to 75k cash investment. That's been very strong. Um, mm. Certainly, the, the run into the end of the year has been, um, has been, has been good for us. And, and obviously, our resellers have been good for them. Um, I think going on to 23, it'll be an interesting first three months, I think, as we, I won't say come to terms, but as we settle into the current interest rates potential legislation and just the euphoria of coming into a new year where we're out of lockdown covid seems to be um under control although it's still with us we're not getting that lockdown scenario when i don't think we'll see any implications there i think uh, yeah it's been a good 22 for me anyway um and i think for for, for most people mm-hmm. and i think 23 will be will be a good year as well i think it's that uh, we've obviously got the cost of cost of living crisis etc but there's that coupled with a, a sense of normality coming back oh. yeah um, is is kind of you've got the negative with the rising costs of things you know that's slightly you've got the the situation in russia yeah and all that uh, that's, that's well, well, well there's big things to remember which are positives i mean one of the ones is i mean um the founding of the nhs system i mean men died invariably at the age of about 65 uh, in 48 um, men are now dying in their late 70s uh-huh. yeah. Um, yeah. women are living longer quality of life's longer 
we may have more moaning going on and bits and pieces of problems. I think the other thing is, is that that group that have gone through, they've got a lot of money to spend, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. either through pensions, whatever, that's coming through. And I, I don't think we've really grappled with that demographics yet mm. um, that's coming through. And that's going to be major, I think, because people are looking at how they can use their money in other investments. And, you know, if you've been in the stock market recently, then sort of it actually hasn't been fun. No. So therefore, I think property may well become increasingly something people move towards. We actually did something a few months ago, Phil, where we yeah. we analysed what you would have made in the last 12 it months. It was whiskey was the best, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It was whiskey was the best, but yes. that was a little bit of a, of a kind of a one-off. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get those. But property is always because you, you, you know. I think it's a constant, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it goes through pockets, but sort of at the moment you can see well, where are you going to go for long term investment? Okay? Yeah. And um, that's your best bet. And you've got, you've got the growth and the rental income, so you've got the yeah. income from two streams, which you don't have in many other investments. Yeah. And you've got something that's tangible that you can see and pick yes. up, and it's not yeah, just a piece pass of paper. Other people. Yeah. 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 So. Well, you've, got, you've got that cliche, haven't you? Property doubling every ten years or nine years or whatever. But when you actually look at it since nineteen fifties, it's it, well, really true. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yeah. Yeah. it's not going to change. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, I mean, on universities, you got to remember, in um, colleges, some, of course, will recruit locally. So, so really, the the demand for accommodation is less so. Yes. Or mm. some that recruit internationally or or regionally with uh -huh. larger names, mm. therefore then the accommodation will be of a higher demand. And of course at that age, you convince your parents that you need to be away. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it's not, I think it's good for um, mental stimulation and development of yeah. yourself to, to yeah, move yeah. away from home. Yes, I wouldn't quite say stand on your own two feet, that's probably not politically correct. Where did you go, Andrew? London. You were in London? I went to London for three years. I wouldn't live in London personally, but I had a whale of a time. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it. it was 78 to 81, happy days. I, I enjoyed every moment. And I would recommend go away. Yeah, I mean, I went to Crew and Alsager, and I was just down the road in Northwich, but I, yeah. I still stayed. It was too early to commute. It wasn't no. a bad place to go, though, Crew and Alsager. It was good for it sports good. side. Very good for sports. I, I, did, I did sports, and then I, and, and then I went on to do business. Yeah afterwards um but it was yeah it was it was part of manchester met that's right. Man yeah. part of manchester met it was a good uh, a good place to be yeah mm. where did you go this afternoon york york yeah lovely lovely city yeah i left school at 16 um worked believe it or not radio luxembourg station yeah, of remember. the stars yeah. first year in mayfair then my parents moved up north and i worked in birkenhead box for about six years so, um, and, and that was good because they sent me on an outbound course, things like that, you develop. Um, and then at university, uh, York was interesting because then, of course, York was one of the poorest cities in the UK. Um, a lot of rebuild going on. So, you know, you, you could really get some cheap accommodation there. Yeah. Whereas, of course, York's one of the places that's gone up. Like oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So... Um, it does show you that change, I think, which is good. And um, yeah, it's, it's, and I was president of the union there, so I got very active in moving things along and things like that. So sort of, that's why I've always had an interest in policy, government, you know, making things work really. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And that kind of leads us on. Oh. <laughs> we want to hear more. Yes. We want to hear more. So. Um, that's that's our bit of stint to talking property. Um, we are now very kindly joined, as we said before, by Professor Phil Harris. And uh, we're going to pass over to yourself, sir, to talk Machiavelli, modern political leadership and lobbying. Okay. First slide. Yeah. Yeah, um, Niccolo Machiavelli is interesting because really he talks about power. Um, he's an observer. 
he's also misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, he was also used politically by a lot of people as sort of explaining things. So consequently, you get a lot of different views. My favourite story about Machiavelli is I actually hosted a conference in Manchester in 2000 and it was to look at Machiavelli 500 years since he appeared from virtually nowhere. And I remember going into Chet's College in Manchester, which is the old town hall, if you like, the old historic bit of Manchester. And I went up to the gate and the watchman on the gate, and we wanted to bring a car in, and I sort of said, can we bring the car in? And he sort of said, oh no, mate, we've got that Machiavelli here today. Um, and it was in broad Manchester, and it was like he was a right winger, really, for Man United, and sort of get a score a hat trick. It's a bit like the World Cup. Um, but Machiavelli is uh, interesting. He was born um, just outside of Florence. His father was a lawyer. Um, his father was probably illegitimate, so therefore in those days that meant that really... Um, your offspring couldn't stand for government. So Machiavelli went in because he was bright, his father was a lawyer, um, into the law, uh, effectively, and public administration. And uh, to sum up in a nutshell, where he's very good, is he's absolutely brilliant at writing and communicating and observing. And that's why, if you like, probably today... We know more about him. So, you know, there's complete works, there's diaries, uh, whatever. But he's got quite a meritocratic rise because really he seems to appear from nowhere when he's about 27 and becomes the second most powerful public servant in Florence. Give you a picture of Florence at that time because it's 1469 Machiavelli's born 1527 he dies Florence is the richest place on earth you know it's got more money more power than anything else you've got the modern banking industry down the road so the term banco banking all comes from around there you've also got if you like um, some of the most powerful people the Medici family of course who actually really found much of what we call modern banking um, artists, you've got Leonardo da Vinci, you've got Raphael, um, and um, you know, really, they're all there. Michelangelo. Um, fascinatingly, in that city as well, they found the first what you would call art galleries. They also found what you would call the first museums by the Medici family. Um, wealth, power. Of course, um, and money attracts people who want to take it out. And we can see that occasionally in all wars. But the reality is, is that um, people want to control Florence, have the money. Some fascinating art, culture going on, and we can see that today. So he has a very rapid rise. Um, the big thing about Machiavelli is this, because he's a public servant, he has this desire to serve and to serve the people of Florence and to serve them well and be accountable. And uh, he's an exceptional observer. Um, he, if you look at him, he's, he's probably only about five foot four, five foot five. And the best pictures, he's got very big brown eyes. And he's one of those people you probably see in the back of a room, you know, mm. just looking in. He's that type. Um, but he writes interesting stuff. So he's really probably what I call the first political scientist. His main ethos is strength and direction. Um, the way you go is important. And uh, really, the sad thing is, is he has a forced retirement because really the Republic falls. He's then kicked out of office as an administrator and believe it or not, he's inculcated in a plot and um, he gets his shoulders broken as part of torture. He's led out eventually, but really um, somebody who's had their shoulders broken and is recovering, 
for the last 10 years of his life, he isn't that strong, you know, when you look at it. He, he manages. He's really what I call a pragmatic liberal. It's sort of what you can achieve. And he's into um, really, you know, what you can move forward. I think the other big thing is, is on 21st century reflections, he's a diplomat. Um, he contributes to decision making. He's clear thinking and he's very good at planning. Um, he makes things work and really, um, you know, he copes with a lot. I mean, during Machiavelli's time, uh, the plague killed regularly. Um, and in fact, actually, he was moved to the mountains as a kid growing up for safety along with his sister. And I, I think we forget when we look back, you know, plagues regularly wiping out parts of the population, people can't move, whatever. But he seems to get through it. Um, I think serious guy, uh, and I'll reflect a little bit more on that. There's some fun things at the <coughs> moment. We are in Christmas, and Machiavelli, of course, sometimes is seen as old Nick. Um, and, you know, we're in the season of Nick Christmas. Um, these are some of the joys we've got at the moment. We've got um, Machiavelli meets Christmas. Um, we've got a Christmas edition of uh, old Nick. And then Bee's Knees is, believe it or not, a, a Machiavellian sort of uh, material you can put on your nails. So sort of, you know, he's been made a little bit of humour. Uh, you can also see Luca Messina and Machiavelli ornament. They've sold out. Um, and there's Luca, a great big chunky guy with a little cat. And believe it or not, the cat's supposed to be Machiavelli. Uh, very popular. And then really, if you really want a bargain, you can buy my latest book, which is only £439.99. Um, it's two volumes, uh, took four years to come about, um, and is electronic, um, and it's a snip. So, so that's my joke. Um, Machiavellian thought. I think if we uh, look at it, he wrote about power, control and fear in terms of leadership. He's most famous for the prince, where he argues that ruling through fear is more effective than ruling through love. Um, there's a big debate about that. The prince didn't really come out, and it, he didn't even give it the title. It was really how he saw power being used. But let's have a look at some other people, um, some thoughts on prime ministers. There were a couple that, sorry, interrupting you, Phil. Mm. A couple I didn't didn't recognise. I got most of them. Which I think. one? This guy, bottom seconds from the from the right, next to Liz Truss. That's Lord North. He's the one who lost North America. I still don't know his name, Lord North. No. No. So he was the prime minister at the time of U.S. independence. All ah, right. Yeah. 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 So that's why he's got the wig, and he, he looks a bit like sort of a George and any other, yes. doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Which is the other one? Um, the other one is this chap, second from the left, bottom row. The one that looks like Tom Selleck. Yeah. Well, well I mean, you should know, really. He, he's the one who led to Suez. Suez. Mm, no. We'll come back to him. Um, it, he was uh, really secretary of Winston Churchill <coughs> and then in office really for about 18 months and, and then came out. Um, so conservative. Um, but one of the things... Ah, to, what? Him? Yeah. Chamberlain? No. No, that's Chamberlain that's up here. Chamberlain in yeah. the top right. Sorry, we're pointing. Well, you can see us yeah. pointing. <laughs> We'll have the answer, or or people can send it in on there as well. And we if can anybody, if anybody it. knows who the second from the left, Mount Button. No, you, you you're getting close. You two. I mean, sort of. This is, is it. He English or American? He's English. So um, he was foreign secretary. Ooh. 
Um, Anthony Eden. Yeah. Sewers. Like it came Absolutely. back to Absolutely. Sewers. Yeah. Yes. And you've got to remember his foreign secretary. Um, so Churchill yeah. he gets yeah. ill eventually and can't go on. And I mean, the most amazing thing I think about Churchill is, is he discovered he had about four heart attacks before sort of he gave yeah. up, you know, and he had one in the middle of the Second World War. But yeah, so he was foreign secretary and then yeah. took a, up the umbrella. But um, he's very famous for the fact that um, he didn't tell anybody that we were going to go to war in Suez and he'd done a deal with the French. And it was more found out by the Americans than Lee. So uh-huh. sort of, it was one, one of the classic ones, you know, we found out after the event and we were in the middle of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that isn't great. But I, I think that if you look at them, if, if you took Machiavelli's view, he'd say something <coughs> bold and make it work. I don't know. He's very difficult. But you're probably saying Thatcher, he, even though it was very painful at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You'd probably say um, perhaps um, Johnson because he did lead an event, uh, whether you liked him mm. or not. Yeah. Um, certainly the bottom left-hand corner one, I think, is really amazing. William, William Pitt the Junior? Yeah. 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 I got him. And, of course, in Northwich, they have one of the great pit clubs in um, Britain, the oldest one, I think it was founded in 1806, mm-hmm. uh, originally, mm-hmm. and sort of it was one of the 20 pit clubs, because of course, he was young, led, and, and really with lots of vivaciousness, oh, and, yeah, yeah. and lots of people then rallied round him, and wanted his memory, you know, and um, he, he's quite good. Yeah, Lord North, you'd probably... Um, that's the interesting one. But then, you know, perhaps one could say trust was bold, but sort of, if you like, it was not thought out. Um, <coughs> some of the others there don't necessarily stand out, I think. You know, sort of really in terms of leadership. Middle row, second, Dennis Healy, is that? No, that's Callahan. Callahan. Yeah. yeah. So Sonny Jim, the <coughs> uh, yeah. worst thing he did, of course, was go on a Caribbean tour in the middle of sort of, you couldn't bury your dead or clean your bins. Uh-huh. And he came back with a su- suntan, sort of looking a bit bronzed, um, uh-huh. you know. And Hence Sonny Jim. Well, yeah, yeah, lost the election. So the, the way you turned out, I think, for these events. But um, let's have a look at... Uh, the next things these are his style so uh, and really with Machiavelli it's always worth looking at this because he could really sum up very well so old injuries are never suppressed by new benefits one of the things he says is if you're going to take somebody out or do an injury to somebody do it permanently Uh because or otherwise they'll come back at you Um, now okay he's reflecting if you like his time um, but you know, vengeance, vengeful, yep. the rest of it. Wars begin when you will, but they do not end when you please. That's from the history of Florence. Uh, I think that's one of the most meaningful. You know, a lot of people have started wars, and you can see at the moment uh, the conflict most immediate in front of us. Yes. You know, I mean, somebody thought it would be over in three weeks because yep. they'd take everything out with whoosh bang wallop. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, that isn't going to be the case, but it impacts on us. Trust? I, I don't know. I mean, that's an immediate one. I, I uh, think we'll, we'll be reflecting on that for a while. But it's a bit of a wake-up call, I think. Mm-hmm. Next one. Yeah, go on. Yeah, his style, all armed prophets conquered, all the unarmed perished. He's actually saying if you're going to go for something, then basically make sure you're prepared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing, everyone sees what you appear to be, few experience what you really are. There's sometimes two faces. He also says in a lot of his work that there's a difference between public policy and what is privately done. And, and I think you can see that at the moment. You know, yeah. he, he really spells that out. So, I mean, 
well, you know, the nurses' dispute is a classic one, isn't it? Really, in the sort of ambulances, I think we know what um, you know the UK wants to do. Can I just show you that one? This I, I think is really interesting. This is actually some of Machiavelli's own writing, and um, you can see in the middle bit, um, just in the third row down, his signature. So he's very clear, writes a lot in detail, does all the sort of things. Core thoughts, um, the slides sum them up, but really, you know, you've got the morality of the 16th or the 21st century. And really, he's reflecting, if you like, a lot of pressure on people. Um, and, and I think that's sometimes where we can draw quite a lot from. So you've got invasions going on, you've got plague you've got a, a lot of change during that you've got if you like the finest bits of the renaissance so you've got um the great greek works being translated coming to knowledge we're also seeing shipments of materials happening and, and some of the technology that's coming about so although it's very transient and you've got people like Chaser of Borgia, he writes about, who's clearly um, somebody who's after power and will do anything to take it. You know, so that's where you get these references, I, I think, to power. Um, yeah, Machiavelli, moral compass and reflection on public affairs. I always think what I get out of him is you've got to look at government policy how it works, how the system works, and what you can influence to bring about change or positive outcomes. Um, if you don't understand it, th then you can't get involved in it. And what he shows you really is, is that, you know, knowledge is power to some extent, and being able to appreciate how to influence it. I suppose is it sort of knowing the game? Yeah. Understanding the intricacies of it and then I won't say manipulating it but playing that to your advantage as you say to get what you're looking for from it yeah I think so um, remember some people can influence legislation to wipe out your business yep um, and especially around environmental issues it's been used very effectively uh -huh. um, and you know you, you can give examples as there's the case of when um converters were put on cars rather than it be lean burn technology uh -huh. three four late major world-class manufacturers were then at a disadvantage <coughs> for five years uh -huh. um, yet it was a lobby of german french italian who brought that in that then rolled out you know so sort of you can change the environment it, it was honda was it with lean burn that were or well, um, it was Austin Rovers. Yeah. Ford had Lean Bird as well, uh -huh. uh, and Honda. So, so they were actually put back about five years. It was Jaguar had it, didn't they, on the XJS? They yeah. brought out. Yes. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, the you you actually yeah. had to have a converter, uh -huh. um, which added, you know, X amounts of the cost. You had to change Wait. all your technology, yeah. and it put them back. I, I think the one I've always wanted to know was who was the person who suggested wheelie bins should be made out of a certain plastic only manufactured by a certain company that then rolled out all over Europe mm. so that actually, yeah, Very nice. there's only one or two yeah. suppliers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, interesting that, I think. You know, but you can do that. Um, mm. Effective public affairs management, that's really how do you manage the process, how do you watch. I think his advice would be the need to appreciate real politics. I think also, you know, the fact that there is a need often enough for quality leadership to sort of drive through change and positive issues, that change is always going to happen. I think his reflections, um, the, you know, th there's some classic ones which he says, which I think you can use almost in a committee. Um, 
the obvious one is to be neutral is to be opposed to you. You know, if you're in a meeting and mm. somebody says I'm neutral on that, well, they're opposed to you. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have and, a and it's so been, it's, yeah. No. Yeah. They're not going to vote for you. They're not going to go for you. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that sometimes one looks at these things in play. Yeah. There's those on your side and where you're going. Those against you. Mm-hmm. And the neutrals are probably opposed to you as well. Mm. Unless you can persuade them over to your side. Yeah, yeah. I, and you know it's classic old magic isn't it really I think um, I quite like his reflections benefits should be granted a little at a time so that they may be the better enjoyed that's really if giving out if you give out too much people don't appreciate it mm-hmm. yeah yeah you know, and, and that's so as so old true. as the hills, isn't it? Really? Yes, it is. It's um, a good one around Christmas time, Matt. Is if you've got small kids, save yeah. them some Christmas presents for Boxing Day, <laughs> <laughs> because they'll appreciate them even more. Because actually, all they're doing Christmas morning is play with the wrapping paper anyway. You know, the sort that buys the present gives them the present, but no batteries. That's next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think this is why where we get old Nick from, really. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The other one I like is, uh, but one thing consoles me, when something involves a number of people, no one person in particular can be blamed. Yeah. So if you've got a lot of people making the decision, etc., then, you know, the person who actually started it off probably doesn't get the blame. Yeah, you it's sort of like blends cover, into isn't the, it? Yeah, it blends into the committee. Yeah. Ah. And, and then you've got his dilemma at the end, I think. Um... You know, it always happened that he, that's the one about neutrality. And then the second one, people who are resolute in order to avoid danger follow the neutral road most of the time. And most of the time they are ruined, you know, and um, it's basically saying you've got to make decisions. You do need to move. You do need to be decisive in moving things Well, forward. if you don't change anything, there will be no change, will there? No, that's right. Um, and, and the other thing is, is you're not looking after yourself mm. or your, your own interests. I think um, he, of course, writes about war. One of the great books a lot of people read after the First World War is his, his uh, work on war, um, which was reflecting, if you like, on his turbulent times. Um, it, as I say, great observer. I think why politicians look to him is the one that really codifies, if you like, what we see as power and politics um, in Europe mm-hmm. comes out of, if, if you like, um, clearly um, 15th and 16th century Italy um, and, and states and conflict. But he does observe, write and gives advice. And I think that's why he's interesting. Um, he dies, of course, and, and there's so many myths about how he died, whatever. But he was a practicing Christian. And then the other thing which is interesting, of course, is most of his books um, were never really printed in what we call, because press doesn't popularise them until about the 1520s. Um, and then all his books are banned. So one of the things you, you, you learn about Machiavelli, and all his books are banned in Italy in particular, and it's 1890 before his books were allowed to be read in Italy. So one of the things I get out of it, as somebody who occasionally writes the odd book and things, is if you can get your books banned, then they really get read. <laughs> you know, and, and, and we've got things like that Lady Chatterley's the classic one, I yeah. suppose, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Salman the, the, Rushdie. Yeah. So... It gives it that sort of lift. Mm. But Machiavelli, I think, quite a principled man, um, interesting life, well recorded, and we're still learning. And I think that's why he's around. Um, <coughs> but yeah, um, clearly one of the most wa- widely read books is The Prince. You know, so many people have had that by the side of their bed. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody you hate, <coughs> and virtually everybody you love. Um, but he would uh, be amazed that anybody even read it because, you know, most of his stuff was just written for a small circle of friends to circulate and that was it. (coughs) 
Interestingly, he wrote plays, poetries, satire. Um, he writes a sex satire because sex is quite important in uh, Florence. Um, and, and really, it's a critique of, you know, the society and what's going on. So um, his love poetry is good as well. Um, he dies um, and his uh, family really... By the way, Machiavelli is derived from the Italian word for nail. So, and they're normally the square nails, which uh -huh. you often see in crucifixes and things mm -hmm. like that. So it's a nail maker, uh, a Machiavelli. Um, but he, he dies, and, and I think his legacy is, is, you know, his literature's read, regularly reviewed, and, and people reflect on it. So, yeah. Um, I, I think it's well worth a real read. Professor Phil Harris, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Thank you indeed. I think one thing, I mean, that, that's just shown me that I don't think people have changed that much in the few hundred years. That's the big years. thing. Yeah. It's, it, that, that's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sayings there that you've come out with and how, how you know, they can be relevant attributed they are, to yeah. relevant they yeah. are today. You know, yesterday and tomorrow and ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, it does show you how little people change character-wise, I think, um, and how we haven't changed in those hundred years. Five hundred um, years. Yeah, five hundred yeah. years. I, I think that's right. Um, and and you know, one of the most popular books is um, Machiavellian Management, uh, which was written by Anthony Jay, who, who of course did the Yes Minister scripts and, mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, in its first 10 years, it sold 6 million copies, and, and it was the main primer in terms of management at Harvard. Um, you know, and still it's in press, because effectively it's applying decision-making to management, you know, and, you know, uh, how you can grapple with complex situations. Um, he was quite funny as well. He did crack jokes, mm. which was good, you know. So, so he was human. Mm. I think Mrs. Machiavelli had a hard time, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Certainly after his shoulders were broken. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they had a thing called the strapado, which is like a hoist. And uh, it was in the bottom of the, what's called the Bargello, which was um, like an early prison police station. And, and he he got inculcated in the plot, so sort of he got dropped several times on that, and and that will have done his shoulders no good at all. Um, he goes on though for about another thirteen years, I think. But sort of, yeah, yeah. I I don't think he was ever a particularly physically fit man, anyhow. Mm -hmm. But sort of, yeah. I mean, it, it was hard times, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Phil, that was fantastic. That Thank was you. absolutely, uh, yeah, very, really interesting. I've certainly learned something this evening. Um, and I hope everybody out there has as well. Always if happy you, to help and give advice. Certainly. And if, you're, if you are interested in learning more, you, you can pick up Phil's book or books. Um, they're available on your website, aren't they? Yeah. Which is uh, phil-harris.com, .com. Yep. I believe. There we go. I believe the link can be put in chat. Um, but again, from from ourselves, thank you very much for coming. My in pleasure, evening. and yeah. every success to you. I, I mean, I think you know Machiavelli's time. You, you had exactly the same industry and businesses going around as well, mm. uh, and dialogue. I mean, he used to quite enjoy sort of going to the nearest thing to a tavern, uh, playing cards, uh, and having a few glasses of red wine. You know, so she's quite human, really. And I mean, yes. you know, that's what you forget. Fascinatingly, um, one of the great Chinese heroes from about 400 AD does exactly the same. He seems to, when you read his poetry, he ambles down the road and then he goes and has a chin wag with his mates and has a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so very um, Christmassy, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Hasn't changed. Hasn't, has it? All these years, <laughs> centuries. There we yeah. go. So um, there we go. That that's another pulse on property. Uh, that was episode five. Um, thank you again, Professor Phil Harris.
for coming in um, and going through Machiavelli. That's taught us a lot. Um, thank you very much to uh, my co-hosts, Mr. Andrew Brassi. Thank you very much. Thank and good you. night. And Mr. Michael Johns. Thank you, thank you Michael. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, again, Cheers. thank you, Professor Phil Harris. Yeah, and Phil will do. Okay, Phil, thank you very much. Um, we would love to have you back on one day, one day if you would uh, we, if you would like. To. It will cost you two cups of tea next time. <laughs> I'm sure we can do that. I'm sure we can run to that just about. Um, so from myself, thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a very merry Christmas, uh, a good time off, and a very happy new year. And we will see you in the new year for Pulse on Property episode six which uh, I believe is on the uh, 31st of January, 7 p.m., um, where we will be going through January's property news. We also have Melissa Ellis from HL Financial talking uh, all things pensions. So Ooh. join us then. I know. <laughs> Need that. I know. We, we, we will get there. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you soon. Merry Christmas, everybody. Good night. Good night.